Uh, welcome. My name is Dan Wakefield. I am here to talk to you guys today for session 14. We're going to talk about contouring intact cervical cancer today. And uh, just as an introduction for myself, I've been in, involved with RCC for the past couple of years, and I'm the chief resident at the University of Tennessee British Oncology Department. I'm also an MPH student at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So it's great to meet everybody virtually. I, uh, I know that we've really had a, a great course thus far. I've been following with the videos and we've had check-ins with the, the administrative staff leading the project. And everyone's really excited for the, the engagement that everyone has brought, the collaboration that everyone's brought. And I hope you're getting out of this course what, what we set as a goal to get out of it, which is not just information, but also relationships and, and that we both learn, that we learn and you learn and we all grow together. Our goal for growth today is is... Uh, a very focused one, and it's how to contact or how to contour intact cervical cancer. And so today, that's what I'm going to talk about for session 14. As a bit of background for me, I always uh, look up where your centers are on the map. So I wanted to show you where my center is on the map. I'm currently talking to you from Memphis, Tennessee, a city nestled by the Mississippi River, known for blues and barbecue, and it's the home of Elvis Presley and the birthplace of rock and roll. My other workplace when I'm not working at the University of Tennessee is at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and we have uh, global reach for that. So it's exciting to have this network and, and building it uh, with you. So this is where I'm speaking to you from. And one of the goals that I had was to meet your needs and serve you with, with where you are and where you're going. So I reviewed the feedback that many centers submitted prior to our course and one of the themes across multiple centers is eventually you have the goal of starting an IMRT program. If you don't already have some early IMRT capabilities and you're expanding it, you're, you're moving, some, some people are moving from you know, 2D to 3D fully and some people have sort of this piecemeal set of tools and experiences. And so we're really speaking to a group today, we're all talking together with a very large spectrum of access to different techniques and capabilities at the different centers. But I'm going to frame my talk today with the mindset that about half of you are looking to have an IMRT program in the next uh, coming years. The other thing that I noticed in feedback that I'm gonna to touch on briefly is there's real challenges in care coordination and especially with concurrent chemotherapy. And so I'm really introducing the idea to you as you move forward in your, in your program improvements and your personal improvements, that that is something that is absolutely key. This is not just about contours or doing them right. It's about being a bit of a air traffic controller, getting patients in and off the runway, and there's a lot of moving parts to coordinate. So we're gonna talk about these things today, and, and hopefully it's, it's helpful based on your feedback. So I, I take the perspective anytime I teach that I don't know it all, and there are places where I go to learn daily. So the old proverb is, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, teach a man a fish, he'll, he'll, he'll eat for a lifetime. And we are going to, I want to expose you on, on how to teach yourself to fish, basically. So if you can see my screen, I'm going to flip over to some resources. In my center, uh, we always stage our patients. Uh, each patient gets staged according to the AJCC version 8. And then we take that staging information or for cervix cancer, the FIGO staging information. And then we move to the NCCN guidelines and, and run the NCCN guidelines, you know, algorithms. So this is a free resource. They have resources, not just for the U.S. National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It, they also have resources that are available for emerging or developing economies that may have more limited resources. And the guidelines are, are found here. So you go, you create a free login Let's say you want to find the cervical cancer guidelines for America's advisory panel. You open up the cervical blocks, you stage the patient yourself based on what information you have in your exam. And then in terms of treatment selection, this is the people who write these guidelines if you're unfamiliar with them. Let's say you have a patient who has been staged, you choose their stage, you run down the algorithm of the workup and the appropriate treatments, and then you end up, let's say, for our case today, we'll talk about this is a patient who's got radiology, radiographic imaging, 
no adenopathy, okay, we're going to proceed with this treatment selection. So it's, it's, it's not a cookbook that replaces thinking. It is a guide that assists in thinking and making sure that we're staying evidence-based in all of our practice. And this is what we do at our center throughout my residency training. It's what I've done for each case, and it's part of my discipline and care management. I'm not talking to you about care management selection today, but I want this to be presented because it is my personal gold standard in patient treatment selection and from which I break uh, my practice up and my attendings do as well. In the last couple of years, I want to just briefly mention that there is a really remarkable summary created. And my residency program has started to incorporate this into our curriculum, as has several other residency programs. If you Google radontables.com, you'll find a pretty fantastic resource. I'll just show you what it looks like. This resource is curated. It's essentially what the NCCA guidelines use as the evidence base. It's a sleek website, but it leads you to a pretty straightforward summary spreadsheet that has all of the different types of treatment sites broken down in sheets at the bottom. And for the GYN data, this is a really fantastic summary. Uh, for anyone who wants to push into the data to understand the nuances between trials and see some commentary that's useful. So uh, I would recommend this highly for you building your evidence base. These are the papers that you would, you know, the NCCN is basing their decision making off of and it is updated almost to the day with late breaking things across different resources, across different conferences and publications. So it's really fantastic. There's also a nice, especially for the resident physicians, guide for the clinical decision making. Now, this is a preparation for the American oral boards, and this is what I'm studying for my oral boards now, as well as my written boards. And so this is what I would do for my patients. This is the workup, the treatment, the simulation, the dose I would choose, and the fields that I would put on. And it describes it really clearly, really succinctly, and it's all in one place. This is a bit of a brain trust of information, but it's really outstanding. So I would point any clinician or decision maker towards this and anyone go into the evidence supporting our decision making towards this. That, that would be what I use. There's also another resource that's relatively new called, let me move my bar, Radonk Review. If you want a more extended kind of bullet point outline, this is another really good resource. It's radonkreview.com. And for GYN, they have an ever-growing, you know, there's like 80 pages. This is, the, this is a live, basically a live textbook for gynecologic cancers. So for cervical cancer, we know that it's going to be in this. It's going to take a minute to load. This is another really good outline. Basically. It's uh, constantly being here. So I wanted to expose this. Uh, whoever has uh, audio coming in, if everybody could please mute their microphones. Thank you. Still hearing. I think Winfrieda, the, there's some noise in the background. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that's a resource list. This is for decision making. But there's a whole other resource list for treatment planning. Video last week, someone requested uh, a book. Perhaps you don't have stable internet to net access. There is a book that's really good that I use, and I use it pretty frequently, especially for 3D. It's by the leaders out of Cleveland Clinic here in the US. And this book, Handbook of Treatment Planning and Radiation Oncology, is a go-to resource for me in my, especially towards the beginning of my residency training. And it provides very clear, very useful breakdowns of how to design three-dimensional beams for a majority of cancer types. So I'd recommend that book. Then last week, Dr. Lee introduced the RTOG Contouring Atlas. That contouring atlas set is really the gold standard for what to do across multiple trials. And it's, it is the foundation for what eContour.org uses for most of its cases. But today what we're gonna be doing is focusing on eContour.org and one specific case out of there. Ben introduced eContour, yes, I'm sorry, recently in our last lecture. I would really recommend, you know, get an NCCN login, get an eContour login, and just start using it as a discipline as you move through your practice. 
Contour is a fantastic system, and they're doing a really good job at UC San Diego. They've done a good job making it and curating it. So, taking a step back from resources and moving into the topic of the day, cervical cancer is really challenging. I, I, I think when I look back across the patients that we've taken care of here, it hasn't necessarily been the technical delivery care, it's been the coordination of care that's been the most challenging in our centers. There's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of social dynamics and social barriers to care, which we're all familiar with in, in our practices. And, you know, we have the goal of completing all of the external beam radiation with multiple cycles of chemotherapy given at the same time in coordination and then delivering brachytherapy within just a few weeks, 56 days or less is the gold standard. And there's a survival benefit to, for doing it in that time window. We succeed in that sometimes at my center, but there are many times that for whatever reason, either social, clinical, or logistical, we are unable to accomplish that. And so it's a bit of a confession to tell you from our center that we're not achieving that goal all the time. But I hope that makes you feel a little bit better because you might also not be achieving that goal. This is the goal. The goal doesn't change. That is our goal and that's what we should strive for for every patient. And I like the description of cervical cancer treatment as a symphony. You know, with the symphony, you've got multiple instruments, you've got multiple timings, and everything has to be coordinated and orchestrated for the piece of music to be beautiful and for cervical cancer treatments with all of these multiple treatments happening in correct timing, this, this metaphor really fits. So we have to execute this symphony or this care co coordination challenge very intentionally. And today we're only talking about one small part of that challenge. The thing that we're talking about today is what's new, which is contouring for cervical cancer. Some of you, some of you participants may have done it. Some of you might be doing it for the first time. But it's interesting, I, I talked to my staff about this lecture and had them review, review my concepts. My center uh, transitioned to a fully IMRT program only about five years ago, where we really started getting rid of our 3D pelvic fields. And so I'm a senior resident here, I'm a PGY-5. I remember doing, doing 3D fields and I, I was here for the transition to IMRT. When I talked to my staff about, you know, what their thoughts were for this lecture, they said, we had to contour, we had to get used to contouring, we had to train ourselves to contour and our dosimetrists to plan and physicists to plan for years before we were ready to transition safely to IMRT. So if your goal is transitioning to IMRT and you're moving from 2D to 3D, this lecture is equipping you to do that and starting to, to practice pelvic contours now will prepare you for your future transition. So all, although 2D and 3D essentially use the same technique, you know, there's no contours required to deliver a four-filled box with blocks on bony anatomy. You're preparing for a new technique and it really can take years. So I would really encourage you, even though it's easier to just put on blocks, to prepare now and learn to contour. So before I move into the contouring component, I want to talk about treatment format. And in terms of philosophy for practice, one of the best sayings that I've heard is, if you don't have a system, then you will systematically fail. I think that's really true in all of our practices, having lists and check, check boxes and algorithms and resources. And especially, this is especially true for cervical cancer. It's also true for cervical cancer contouring. The things that I'm about to teach you is an example of one type of system for contouring. And I just want to say I'm going to present it concretely. We're going to use eContour's case, which is concrete as well. But there's multiple systems. What I would encourage you to do is if you're using other protocols or other evidence-based contouring guidelines, stick with one and learn it really well. And choose one and be a master of it. 
then surgeons like to say the best procedure for you to do is the one that you know. Well, we're all learning a new procedure here, but I would choose steps for that procedure that are very concrete. And I'm teaching you one example today. There are others, but this is the one we're going to work from. So simulation is the first step for success. When we simulate patients for cervical cancer, we do a CT sim on a flat surface. Our center uses three millimeter side slices to cover the entire pelvis. It's in the supine position. If we're doing IMRT, we use a vac lock bag to keep the, the mold of the body to be accurate each day with our cone beam CT. And then the swabs and the anal markers and the contrast matter. So we use vaginal swabs, dips, and contrast to see the length of the vagina. Typically that's placed by the physician. We have an anal marker that's placed on the anus to mark the extent of that uh, organ. If there's local invasion of the tumor, which most of our cases have, or there's any suspicious bulky lymph nodes that have already been seen or known about, then we recommend IV contrast. Uh, we don't use it in every case, but we do use it to help us see better. We use oral contrast in some patients, but I have to say that's rarely used in my center. Multiple protocols recommend that. We also acknowledge that rectal contrast is used in some centers, especially if it's a rectally invading tumor, um, but it's rarely used in our center. When the patient is simulated, we have a full bladder scan. So what the full bladder does is it pushes the bowel up and away from the target volumes, and that's requested that the patient does that before each treatment. So essentially what I tell my patients is drink a bottle of water before you come in about 30 minutes to an hour before your treatment. Please don't be bursting with urine, but be comfortable with urine. And this is especially important for them to do long-term when we're doing our treatment. We ask them to have the, the full bladder daily to decrease our small bowel dose. If we're using IMRT, we also do an empty bladder scan where the patient will come get scanned with a full bladder, urinate, get scanned with an empty bladder, and then we combine those two to see how much the cervix moves, especially in, in definitive or intact cervix treatment. That cervix can move two or three centimeters, and you'll see a lot of movement when you start to do more IMRT. It, and obviously, we'll, we'll mark the isocenter with tattoos and markings. So moving into contouring. So what we're doing today is all based on the e-contour case, which is based on the RTOG consensus guideline from 2011. You can go to that website, set up a free login, and we're going to review a bit of that today. But I'm going to go through the steps of what contouring recommendations are, and then we're going to look at the case ourselves before we finish. So we're at 1222. should be right on time. So we have, I've put in this presentation all of the guidelines that are in eContour, and we're going to have those there in this presentation for you to download and keep. You can also find it at eContour.com. We'll walk through them right now. So these are the CTV, the PTV, and the organ at risk recommendations. So let's bounce over to eContour. So eContour is loaded with cases. If you're transitioning to 3D and you're, or you're transitioning to IMRT in the future, this is a fantastic resource. I can't say it enough. When I was at the beginning of residency, this is what I would go to for just about every case. And I'm nearing the end of my residency, and it's what I go to for just about every case. Just to make sure that I've not missed anything. So it takes a second to load. We have on the website here, we have a patient history. So this patient is a patient, 38 year old female with stage 2B squamous cell carcinoma cervix with bilateral iliac nodal involvement. She status post a biopsy. The prescription tab on the right says she received pelmic IMRT to a dose of 47.6 and 28 fractions. She had a boost, a simultaneous integrated boost to 59.4 and 28 fractions with concurrent cisplatin. And then she got brachy 600 centigrade times five, and all radiation was completed within 56 days, gold star. Let's move into the contours. So I'm going to walk us through the normals first, turn all of the targets off, make this full screen so maybe it'll look a little bit clearer. And let's start from the top. We'll start with the bladder. So for IMRT, the multiple trials used bone marrow sparing, 
for their treatment planning. And this is available to you in the future when you transition to IMRT. I'm not gonna talk about that today and it's not my presentation. The bladder contour is pretty obvious. It is the full bladder. The bowel contour, I'm gonna do the obvious things first. The bladder contour is pretty obvious. The femoral head right and left, pretty obvious. And a note on the rectum. The rectum is a contour that includes the rectum inferiorly from the, the anal canal uh, the musculature that comes across right here. See the sling and that muscle right in there and then it stops right there. So that sling is the bottom and going to the top. The top is when it bends over and becomes the sigmoid. So this is the difference between sigmoid and rectum. Sometimes the sigmoid is floppy, flops down. You got some sigmoid and rectum. I would say that's probably some sigmoid too. And then the sigmoid is going out here. So those are two separate structures. They essentially they have very similar constraints. So let's look, show you what the bowel looks like. So there's a lot of variability in how different people contour the bowel, like the RTOG method, which is represented here. It's really a bowel bag. This bowel bag includes the large and small bowel. It is a mobile structure. It goes around and it moves each day. Uh, this is, again, a little shy right there, I would say. It's always easier to criticize than create. And I would encourage you as you move towards IMRT to protect the bowel, use this resource, and acknowledge there's some variability. Some people cap the bladder because the bladder moves up and down. Maybe some people include the top of the bladder. In, in their bowel constraints eventually with IMRT, but this is what the bowel con contour would look like. So those are, the, those are the normal organs at risk, or OARs. The targets are what we're really focusing on today. So this prescription was delivered. We have an idea of what the final's gonna look like. Let's walk through how they got there. So the CTV subdivisions are by that consensus statement that I mentioned. The CTV1 includes the GTV, the cervix, and the entire uterus. So I'm gonna turn that on for you. Uterus, cervix, CTV, and then that pocket of air right there is gonna be the top of the vag vagina. The parametria and superior vagina are CTV2. So top of vagina two centimeters below the in most inferior extent of the tumor, which is what you'll find on your exam. And then when you put the swabs in there, you'll be able to see the top of the vagina if they're placed correctly. So you see the parametria provided laterally, cervix, and then coming down, the vagina, and then CTV3. CTV3 is the lymph node areas. So the lymph node areas that need to be regions that need to be covered for cervical, intact cervical cancer are the common external and internal iliac lymph nodes, vessels, artery and vein, and the presacral nodes. And what, what we do is typically we'll create a cursor with, I, I usually do a cursor with about a 14 millimeter circle. And then I paint from the middle of that circle using the point, a seven millimeter margin around the vessels that excludes the adjacent bowel, bone, or muscle. I'm gonna turn off the other CTV so we're not distracted and we'll, we'll start from the top here. So the upper border of this CTV is gonna be at the aortic bifurcation, which is right here. It's usually the L4 or 5 interspace. We all know that from the 2D and, and uh, blocks that we draw. The Inferior border is going to be going down, down, down. You'll notice there's a seven millimeter margin taken out of all of the muscle, extending into these little pockets back here and come out of bowel, come out of muscle, but extending into these little pockets back here. And then this, typically we would include this presacral or the, the sacral hollow and this foramina in our, my contours I typically do. And then down into the presacral space. Again, this is a little shy for what I normally contour, uh, but it's a good example. And then if I could show you the sagittal, the inferior extent of that area is going to cover 
uh, down to either S2 or S3 interspace. And then coming off, right under that interspace is going to be the piriformis muscles. So you want to carve out of the piriformis muscles, covering the vessels with a seven millimeter marker, and coming out of the bowel and the uterus and everything as you come down. And then it inferiorly goes to the top of the femoral heads. Right there. So I have different attendings who have different styles. The top of the femoral heads is, is acceptable, and that's the textbook. Some people come down all the way down into this notch. But that is the bottom and the top. That is the margin that is typically put on. And note that we're excluding the, the normal structures that aren't lymph node areas at risk or vessels at risk. One thing I would tell you, just a pro tip, as you're contouring patients, when a patient gets simulated and they have swabs placed in their vagina, they're usually tensed up. And when that tensing happens, the pelvis rotates. It can go up, can go down, usually not comfortable. When they come back for treatment on the table, the pelvis can typically fall out, or fall down. And when they relax, that's why I cover this little pocket right here. When you move to IMRT and do a daily cone beam CT, being aware of that pelvic relaxation can help you from the miss back here. So when this patient came, they, had, they were found to have bulky lymph nodes. So they contoured the GTV on these lymph nodes. The case that we're gonna give you guys to do does not have these lymph nodes. But if you did want to boost, these lymph nodes are drawn here. And then they talk about the PTV expansions. So in the PowerPoint and here, you have access to these notes on PTV expansions. And they're different for a reason. So the nodes, don't move very much. And there's a nice paper from 2012 by Dr. Khan uh, that talks about the, the risk of missing and, and a consensus statement on the PTV expansions. For the nodes, a seven millimeter expansion is recommended with daily uh, cone beam CT, typically with IMRT. But a seven millimeter expansion for CTV3, for that nodal CTV. And then the CTV1, that cervix that's being moved around by the bladder moving the uterus back and forth and up and down, they recommend 15 millimeter expansions on that for CTV1. And for CTV2, the parametria, which is not moving very much, and the top of the vagina, which is also not moving very much, is 10 millimeters. So that's the thought process behind these different or variable expansions. So those expansions are made on the CTVs and then the PTVs are brought together, all three of them in a Boolean process to a PTV final. And they use 4760, my institution uses 4525, and both of those are acceptable. So if you have a patient who has lymph nodes that are grossly avid or bulky or biopsy proven or pet avid, then you contour them. And then you add typically a seven millimeter margin around that GTV. But I will say, as they know, it is limited by how close the bowel is. So we don't want to give the bowel 60 gray. We want to keep it more like 50. So that is an example of the uh, CTV contours. And I'm going to turn on the PTV contours so we can all see those together here. That's a lot of lines. Leave these off for just a second. Go up and down. So the final is going to look like this. And you see with the, the PTV expansion, this the sacral hollow is still covered, but it's a bit shy. So if there's a lot of relaxation there, I might potentially miss that region at risk. But this whole uterus is covered with a margin. All the nodes are covered with a margin. And this would be a textbook plan. Our textbook set of contours. So, all right, 1234. That walks us through this section of my notes. Please refer to eContour for questions on that, and you'll find a deep well of, of treatment options, but this is a what I would call a gold, gold standard approach. So let's talk about field selection. We, in the 2D era and 3D era, use a very similar technique. So the conventional technique is either two fields or four fields, and you know, the APPA fields are, are more frequently used for thin patients or for patients that have uterosacral ligament involvement. And, you might consider a midline block to avoid dose adjacent to the, to the implant that you're going to put in. And if you're treating with extended fields, which is something I haven't introduced yet, 
you want to cover the periaortic lymph nodes plus any, any periaortic lymph nodes plus a two centimeter margin on gross disease. Some might even say four centimeters. So that four field pelvis will include the GTV and CTV as defined by planning CT. And um, if you are choosing additional fields, you can consider uh, a boost to the parametria depending on the patient's response from 5.4 to 9 gray for those patients with, with uh, lymph node positive or 2B or 3B disease. So the conventional fields, we are um, all, I believe in our training across our centers, we're all, we're all delivering these. We all are familiar with these, but the superior border is L4, L5 or the S, L5, S1 interface. The inferior border is the bottom of the operator forama to cover the proximal to two thirds of the vagina or or the lowest extent of the disease plus a three centimeter margin. The lateral field is going to be two centimeters beyond the lateral margins of the true bony pelvis. The anterior field is going to be the anterior margin of the pubic synthesis, um, unless there's extreme bladder involvement, you might consider extending that to the, uh, a little bit. The posterior margin is going to be really through the S2-3 interface, but, but typically in our center we extend that for ad adequate margin on the presacral nodes. When you choose to do extended field RT, let's say that you know commons have a bulky node or there's, a, there's an obvious lymph node on your CT scan that, that shows that there's a periodic node you need to cover, the border should be superior to include the, the T12 L1 interspace or, or at least two centimeters above the highest gross node. So this is an example of a typical pelvic field. You know, this is for an intact cervical cancer. In our center, we typically cover the entire sacrum and you see the blocks as demonstrated there. And this is, uh, the blocks are a little bit different here. You notice the posterior uh, border is, is anterior to uh, this region as well, not covering the entire rectum in this patient. But I wanted to show this slide because it has a nice description of when, after you're done contouring everything, what the vessels would look like. So you'll see that whenever you create your 3D volumes, or to be honest, when you start your IMRT program and you create your IMRT volumes, the dose cloud is going to look pretty much the same as what is covered by, by this. So the common iliac, external iliac, inguinals, presacral lymph nodes, and then this would be the, the primary region. So this is an example of extended field with inclusion of the periortics, which I believe you're also familiar with. And this would be an example of fields for a, a textbook for parametrial boosting. And the, the borders for this would really be the SI joint to the obturator frame and then laterally, the same as the whole pelvic field. Immediately, you're really blocking that central area where the implant's gonna be so you can dose escalate in your, your HDR component. So I'm at, I'm at about 1240 here. Our dose in our center, as I mentioned, is 45 and 25. Other patient, other centers use 50. 50 gray and 28, or 47.6 and 28, and, or I'm sorry, 50 and two gray fractions. So what I want to make sure is emphasized is this is one component of definitive cervical cancer treatment. It is always followed by brachytherapy for definitive cases. And that's the topic of another lecture. In fact, RCC has put on a pretty, pretty in-depth and, and a very successful, actually, HDR training program. If your center does not have an HDR training program, we should certainly discuss those, or doesn't have an HDR program, is about to start one, or wants to improve your HDR program. This is a bit of a commercial for our previous lectures, which I, I believe all been recorded, and we can, you can reach out to your moderator or the site-specific coordinator, but it's the topic of another lecture. But because it is so important, and patients, are not going to get cured without it. I want to make sure that you walk away from this lecture knowing that your contours and your external beam is get started about a week or two later. You really need to be, as we are in our center, anticipating and preparing for the extensive HDR workflow. I like this paper. It had a, nice, had a nice figure describing all the steps to a successful HDR implant in, in the uh, image-guided era, era. And this is a paper out of the University of Virginia here in the U.S. But what I like to say is you need to have your mind on what your implant is going to look like when you're contouring for your external beam. And you need to have your mind on what your implant is going to look like in the middle of the external beam. And you need to have your mind on 
what the implant's going to look like at the end of your external beam. And then you need to do your implant on time. Sometimes that first implant, and, and often in our center, we'll do one implant in the last week of external beam and then four more after the external beam is completed. <coughs> so that's the extent of the lecture that, I, that I've prepared. We have a homework assignment that is going to be coming out. It's been designed and we are um, going to create each of you a personal ID with a case and pronoun for you to contour. The initial thought of, of our goals for this course was to be that each of our participants would walk away having created volumes for a cervical cancer case and having created a plan for a cervical cancer case that had been QA'd. And as we move into the last half of this course, we are going to uh, attempt to get all of you to a request to get all of you to do contours in prono. Instructions are going to follow on that from our team, but I want to put it on your homework, or I want to put it on your radar as a bit of homework for our, our course. The clinicians, we would request all of the physicians or physicians in training. Also, I think it's if you're if if you're interested, the dosimetrist and physicist. We would, we would request that you all contour a sample cervical case in prono. And then for our physicist and dosimetrist, we would ask that you would plan a case yourself. So it's going to be two separate assignments. One is contouring from square one. And two is planning. For the planning case, what we're going to do is send you volumes that you can create blocks for yourself and then create a plan for yourself in your treatment planning system. And we'll give you clear instructions on how to download those contours and scan and how to upload your final plan to Prono for our evaluation. So that is on your radar. I anticipate that we will be able to send out our final instructions on this homework on Monday. And at that point, we, we be requesting you to complete it probably within the next two weeks, but we'll give you a final date. So I hope that this was a helpful lecture. That concludes what I've prepared for today. And I would love to open it up for any questions that anyone might have. Yeah, I have one question, please. Yes. You said uh, you use a dose of 45 to 50 EBRT. When do you use 45 and when do you use 50? It's a good question. Are you translating while I'm asking or while I'm responding? Uh, just respond. We all speak English. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. My Arabic is rusty. So I will say it, it depends on the case. I, I, I think that 45 and 25 is our standard. But if we have patients with bulky disease, what we will do is 50. If their bowel anatomy will allow it, the bowel is up and out away. And also if we're trying to get extra dose into the primary before the implant, let's say it's a big bulky primary. So it depends on patient's anatomy. It depends on the patient's tumor size, but that would be the things that we would think about. So I, I'm looking back at the chat now here at the end. I see that I made a mistake not telling you what the ITV is. So the ITV is explained there from SOHA. Essentially, it's taking into account any motion, anybody who hasn't looked at the chat. So let's say you have a full bladder scan. We'll take that scan, and then the patient urinates, and we bring them back, and we do an empty bladder scan. Those scans can have very different locations for the cervix, the bottom part and the top part of the uterus and the very top part of the vagina. And I would say if there's one criticism that I have of the contour guidelines that were made in 2011, it's that the evidence and the, the science has evolved uh, in the last probably three or four years to realize there's, there's a lot of motion in that area. There can be up to three centimeters, believe it or not, of motion in the cervix with a uterus that is moving between the two scans. So most, I would say 95 plus percent of patients have less than two and a half centimeters of motion. 
and I would say probably 90% have a centimeter and a half of motion. So the centimeter and a half is a historic, but at our center, we use a two and a half centimeter expansion on that CTV for CTV one to account for extra motion. And really at the end of our contouring, the, that whole pelvic inlet is, is covered. So what other questions do we have? I think someone was saying that they're having difficulty um, uploading to Prono. I don't know. I think you said there'll be instructions sent, right, regarding that? Yes, we'll give clear instructions for that. It will be probably by next Monday. Okay. okay. And okay. yes, just anticipate that. Then yes. someone is asking, I don't know if that question would be for you though. He's saying we don't have diaphragm connections, connection with our TPS. Is there other suggestions? I don't think I understand the question. So for the contouring, all the contouring will be done in Prono. For the okay. planning component, I will ask our team on how to best handle that. And we, if that person could go on and email their coordinator and let them know that limitation, we would appreciate it. Okay. Now, Saif Abdul Hadi is asking, uh, when do you treat with brachytherapy? So the brachytherapy is immediately following the external beam completion. If not, the last week of external beam. So in order to meet that 56 day goal, what we will typically do is do a brachytherapy implant in our center it's at the Monday of the last week of treatment with external beam and of course that takes all day and we add on that one extra treatment for external beam at the end. The other thing that we have done to meet that 56 day goal is move towards patients with some favorable anatomy doing a brachytherapy treatment that's not five fractions but rather four fractions but that's not every patient. I see a question about a frozen pelvis and I'm sorry I don't know what that means. <laughs> Could they describe that? Do you just mean a tumor that's filling the whole pelvis? Like a T4, unresectable? It was a question, uh, it was a question from Masoud. He sent it me privately, but I shared it. So Masoud, can you elaborate more? What do you mean by frozen pelvis? Okay, meanwhile, Mayada is asking, the question is in Arabic. She's asking what isotopes are used for to treat uterus, or I guess endometrium maybe, uh, using uh, for brachytherapy. So I know in this uh, part of the world we use iridium and not too, correct? Yeah, that, uh, that's our center. Yeah, but I think if in other parts of the world they could also use low dose rates, right. cesium 137 for example, correct? Right. Okay. Mayada, in the world of the Arab world, we use iridium 192. We have HDR in the Arab world. فممكن كمان تستعملوا سيزيوم 137 في العادي سيزيوم 137 بيجوا او ماي جاد اي كانت ترانسليت اللي هو بيسكلي سيرفل ولا اي كانت ريك ان اربيك اور ان انجلش ذاتس باد ذا اريديوم 192 تيبيكلي هاف ون سورس بس ويز سيزيوم 137 يو ود هاف سيرفل وانز فور اكزامبل يو نو وات اي سين سو اي ام ذير وي جو جودنس في حاجه عايزه اقولها برضو ماشينز اند اتس بيرفكت لانها بتقعد 5 ييرز هي موجودة في ألكسندريا بس مش في ألكسندريا يونيفرستي في ألكسندريا آتي المستقبل في HDR 3D Cobalt and this is I think إنه ده أحسن حاجة للعالم العربي لأنه دي تبقى حاجة very very applicable وهتبقى لطيف يعني HDR What about I think it's called electronic bracket therapy right when you use the miniature x-ray tube is that ever used for uh, uh, Joanne cases or not really? I've never it's seen not, it. That's not something that's been used at our center. Gotcha. And it's, as far as I know on trials, I don't think that we have a lot of evidence based on that, but. I see. So, um, I see a question. I'm sorry. I'm going to finish yes. the topic. What's the, what no, else? No, no, we're going to read the next question. So go ahead, please. Yes. So how do we boost the dose to a positive lymph node after EBRT to 45 gray? Okay, that's a good question. Okay, so one day if you, or, or currently, if you're using IMRT, you can deliver two types of boost. One is 
simultaneous and the other is sequential. So simultaneous is delivered at the same time as the 45 gray volume. And that is the example, this. So GTV nodes and then that PTV 5936. Let's look at what they did here at eContour. So they did a simultaneous boost. So the 5936 was being delivered at the same time as the 4760 volume. Now with external beam or, th or with 3D, what we would expect would be you would finish your, your, your 50, 40 or 50 volume, and then you would add in a boost sequentially. And that sequential boost would be in, in essence to this volume or to that we described the parametrio coverage with the block that I, that I showed before. And it would be sequentially using your chosen fractionation. Okay. So we have just a couple minutes left. It's 450, or I'm sorry, 1254 by my time. I don't know what 54 it is at your time, but I want to show you something really quickly that might save you a little bit of time in Prono. So when you get your instructions on contouring in Prono, you can go to your specific case and navigate to begin your contours. And I'm a creature of habit. I always start with the bladder. We're gonna give you instructions on how to use Prono, how to do the contouring in it, but this is a little bit of an intro. You're here, you have your CT brought up, go to structures, and then within structures, go to edit structure set. And for editing the structure set, you will then click on bladder. And for the bladder, you see you have options. So slice navigation, that's going up and down, windowing, you can change the windowing like this. If you want to change the contrast on the screen, you can zoom in. You can zoom to a selection. Okay. You can zoom to fit. I kind of like the selection better. So let's go back. And then you can pan up and down. You can draw and you can paint. And so I'm working on a laptop here. So forgive me for my shaky hands. This is why I'm not a surgeon. You draw the bladder. You know, I kind of undercovered the bladder wall, working on a touchpad here. Go back, right? That's a bladder contour, okay? That's not complicated. But what I want to show you is, I'm going to go up three slices. You know, if you go up three slices every time, then you're contouring a half or a third. And when I have that done, I'm sure many of you have treatment planning systems or have worked in them, but then you click interpolate and that button interpolate has put in contours between the two. So that will save you quite a bit of time in contouring, especially your normals. And I wanted to make sure that you saw it. So let's say that you wanted to take that contour and go to the next slice or well, you can copy it from that slice, go to the next slice, copy it from that slice edit and tweak it a little bit. And uh, let's say you wanna go down, copy from the next slice, previous slice, previous slice. You wanna erase that one, you clear that slice. You wanna clear them all, you clear all. So that's an example of contouring. I think the interpolation option will save you a good bit of time. If you're able, please set aside some time to focus on learning these contours and, and getting some hands-on experience in Prono. I see one question. So the contouring of VMAT is the same as IMRT? Yes, contouring for both is the same. The planning's different, but the contouring is the same. So I'm gonna conclude. Thank you so much to everyone for participating and for your great questions. And we will see you next time. Thank you.